So I'm here to talk to you about a real cool way to deploy GraphQL servers um, that I've been really excited about for at least last week. Um, <laughs> you know, as you may know, uh, we've spent a lot of time thinking about GraphQL clients specifically and GraphQL state management with React on the Apollo team. Um, but now uh, the eye is, is shifting to GraphQL servers and server deployment. So it's going to be a very exciting year. And, and that's where this comes in. So uh, in the next 10 minutes, I want to show you, um, first of all, what is the fastest way to get GraphQL going at your company if you don't have any GraphQL? Second, why uh, serverless is a great option to deploy your GraphQL server if you're looking for a simple way to do that. And uh, why Apollo Engine, a tool we built, is a good way to fill in the gaps of that architecture. And the third is just walk through how you might set up that production-ready architecture in just a few minutes. Um, and I learned my lesson over the last couple of talks that I've done to never actually do real live demos, so I just screenshotted it when I did it earlier today, and it totally worked. Um, <laughs> so that was great. All right. So uh, you know, it's great that John was just talking about putting GraphQL APIs on top of REST, because I think that's actually an often overlooked but extremely critical way that GraphQL, I think, should be used in a lot of different places. Because uh, what we've heard from people is that almost every single time you're trying to build a new front end or a new feature um, inside an organization with a lot of data, the APIs you have are almost never exactly what you're looking for. So either you're forced to call APIs that return you a bunch of data you don't need, or often you have to wait for new API endpoints to be constructed, or there's some sort of problem. And when we were talking to people maybe two years ago, one thing we heard is some people even actually build a new API back end for like every single feature, uh, which seems real intense. Um, so uh, GraphQL might be able to help you there because it might help you uh, build those applications a lot more quickly and have great tooling and not have to deal with the rigid API that you had before. Um, but at the same time, if you want to get GraphQL going in your company as fast as possible, you don't want to worry about complicated infrastructure. You don't want to worry about rewriting your whole backend or anything like that. And so um, I think if we could have a really lightweight way a really simple way to deploy a GraphQL API on top of our existing backends, I think that would be super sweet. So I think a great solution to this problem is to put GraphQL directly over your existing APIs. So there's been a lot of different discussion out there, especially as GraphQL was getting started about putting GraphQL directly over your database or starting a new application using a tool like GraphQL or something like that. Um, but I think this is really the killer use case for GraphQL, is putting it on top of existing backends that you already have that you want to make better. Um, even if you're not talking directly to your backend, if you're just talking to REST APIs, you already get a whole ton of benefits. Um, you're definitely going to get a better developer experience because your API is now going to be self-documenting. It's going to be much easier to write queries. You don't have to do multiple requests on the client. Um, you're going to get much smaller payloads because if you ever called like the GitHub REST API and gotten like 20 kilobytes of data when you were looking for like three fields, um, now you can do that on the backend in your GraphQL API instead of all the way from your clients. And also, I think you might get a lot better insight into how your client is performing. Because when you send that GraphQL query actually as one unit to the server, um, that GraphQL server can actually know all the data that's required for a particular view and track what it took to actually execute that, which we'll see in a second, which is something that's actually a lot harder to do if you're making all those requests individually from your UI. Um, so my point here is, even if you're not hyper-optimizing your GraphQL API to do like the absolute smallest number of requests, and it's just the same requests you were doing from the client, but now you're doing them inside a server, you already get a lot of benefits. Um, so how do we make that GraphQL layer that we're throwing into our infrastructure feel less like another piece of infrastructure you have to manage, another server that you've got to deploy, um, and make it feel like just a, a thin thing that just translates from one thing to another? Well, if you want to avoid having a server, clearly you want serverless, because um, <laughs> that's, that's the whole point. Um, so if you use serverless functions, like something like Lambda or Google Cloud, mostly just Lambda, that's the only thing that I think people use, um, you don't have to do any manual scaling at all, because you just get a new function whenever you make a new request. You don't have to worry about how many containers you're running, what their CPU is, whether they're crashing. You can really easily deploy new versions and have new requests go to those versions right away. Um, if you have an error, it's not a big deal. Uh, you just get a new function the next time. So I think, actually, serverless is a really great way to go with GraphQL especially if you want it to feel like that really thin translation layer and not like a whole other service or backend that you have to manage. And that's especially because I think that the people that are best equipped to manage that GraphQL server are the front-end developers or product developers that need that API, not the people at your company that normally run those backend services, which is 
Something that I didn't initially think a couple of years ago, but as we've been talking to more and more teams, we've often seen the teams be the most successful where it's the front end developers who are in charge of that particular API layer. So um, another thing that I'm really excited about is Apollo Engine, which is this tool that we've been developing. And the thing that I've been really excited about over the last week is that it specifically really well complements um, this function mentality. So uh, there's a lot of things that are pretty hard to do when you've got this serverless setup where every time you, you throw away your entire environment, every time you do another request, um, it can be hard to do performance tracing because that often requires aggregating data over some period of time. Um, it can be hard to track errors because if that function crashes, how are you going to get that error and aggregate it into a single place. It can also be hard to do stuff like caching across those requests because inside a container or a long-lived server, you can memoize stuff, you can like use e-tags, whatever, with your back end. Um, but it's a lot harder to do that with Lambda. And so I was wondering if, if we could get a lot of the best of both worlds um, by adding Engine on top of it. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do in the rest of the talk. So um, first, we're going to see how easy it is to deploy a JavaScript GraphQL server to Lambda using this tool called Up that my coworker James told me about. Um, and then we're going to see how easy it is to deploy Engine, which is a stateful thing, using Fargate, which is a new technology that AWS released just a month ago to deploy containers just as easily as you can deploy Lambdas. Um, and if you want more complete directions about how to do this, you can go to this repository uh, made by James that I just followed to make this talk. So let's see what it looks like. OK, so first, um, we've got to write a GraphQL API. So uh, this is where you would apply all those tips that you learned from, from John. Um, we've got a, a great example online you can find that uh, uses the Ticketmaster API to retrieve some information about upcoming concerts in your area. Um, but it's actually not too hard. You just write a couple of resolvers, you call fetch in there, and you hit that REST endpoint there you're trying to hit, and then you can really easily use that data. Um, then you just really easily take that schema that you wrote, you bind it to an HTTP server, the same way that you would do it without Lambda. Um, you know, we're just using Express here, because it turns out the tool we're about to use doesn't require you to write any Lambda-specific code at all. It's just like writing an Express web server the same way you would write it any other way. And this is actually the entire file that, that does that part. Um, and then the last thing we do is we just write a couple of lines of configuration that you don't even have to look at. You can just get it if you download that repository. And then you literally just type one command, which is just up. Um, and then you get your server on Lambda. And then you type up URL, and you have a URL to your server that is running. Um, so OK, so before we move on, let's see if that actually works. So we've got a server running on Lambda. We can indeed, um, oh my god, this keyboard. There we go. We can get a list of some of my favorite artists, which I think includes uh, Kansas, Lil Yachty, and Jason Mraz. Um, and uh, all of these artists have upcoming concerts in my area. I checked that. So for example, uh, there are concerts at these timestamps. Um, and you can also get nice images. So for example, I think this is going to be an image of the band Kansas. There you go. Um, and so these are all coming from that Ticketmaster API that we wrapped with that code that I was telling you about. And in a second, I'll show you how easy it is to actually redeploy a new version of that API. Where did I put my presentation? Oh, over here. Perfect. All right. And one thing you can see over there is there's this little extensions bit at the bottom of the response. Um, and that's going to come into play when we set up this engine thing. So right now, we're hitting the Lambda directly. But what benefits do we get if we hit it through another thing? <laughs> so we'll see in a bit. Um, so it turns out, deploying Engine, Engine is this thing that's kind of like a GraphQL proxy that you can get just in the form of a container. And with Fargate, it's super easy. You just go to this URL. You basically just type in uh, the URL to that container on the Docker registry. Um, and then you put in um, some configuration directly into the AWS console. And then you hit like a Create button. Um, and then it's pretty great. You get a whole lot of green checkboxes on your screen. Um, that set up all this kind of stuff that you would normally have to set up on AWS yourself. From over there, you might not see, but the checkboxes are all over here. Um, it sets up all kinds of stuff. It sets up load balancing. It sets up VPCs, subnets, task definitions, services, clusters, um, really just with one button click. So I think this new product that they released a month ago makes a whole lot of stuff a lot easier. Um, so this is super sweet. 
Um, and then you're up and running after you click through some dialogues. Because it's AWS, it's maybe a few more dialogues than you would hope for. <laughs> but, um, but you basically just click next on all of them. OK, so now let's see what happens when we hit the same endpoint uh, through that thing. And I think I've prepared a query, so I'll type it in again. Um, so you can see that we get also the data that we were looking for. Um, and when we scroll back down to the bottom, we don't have those extensions anymore because now Engine is running in front of our server and it's actually consuming that data for us. So let's see what we get. I'm going to hit this a couple more times. OK. Um, so this is the Engine UI here. Um, and I think if we refresh this, we will indeed see, OK, we will see that we did a couple of requests. This app is very unpopular um, because I'm the only one who uses it. Uh, so there have only been nine requests in the last hour. But one really neat thing that we can do right away is we can start to get traces of how our GraphQL uh, executed. So we can see that the My Favorite Artist field took uh, 55 milliseconds, that the Events field took 126 milliseconds. This is how long it took to actually hit that Ticketmaster API to get that data back that we were looking for. And so that's where it consumes that extension data that comes from the GraphQL server and gives you more insight into how your server works um, and is able to actually aggregate that over time to give you uh, histograms of your performance. And because it's all based on the queries that you're doing, based on the different UI queries you're doing in your UI, you can see how different parts of your app are performing. Um, one thing that I think is really cool here is that you can actually see some of the overhead that Lambda adds to your request which is basically the time in between Engine actually invoking that Lambda request and uh, the request actually starting to execute. There's like at least 50 or 60, 60 milliseconds there. So this request um, that I screenshot here in total took 250 milliseconds. That's like OK. Um, I think that's just like part of, the, part of the deal of using serverless a little bit is that um, because you're cleaning everything up right, every time, um, it sometimes takes a little bit longer than having that request running. Uh, or that server running. But this is what I got really excited about in the last week, is that because Engine has that stateful thing going on, it can actually solve that for you with caching. OK, so this is where it's actually a live demo. So in order to turn on caching, I think it's pretty easy. We will find out. Um, the only thing we have to do is add some directives to our schema, where we can say, we would like to cache this data for 10 seconds. And I'm getting real nervous now because I'm about to deploy some code. Um, so yeah, so we added some directives here that say we want to cache these types for 10 seconds. And once we deploy, and we're going to see how easy it is to deploy to Lambda using this tool, we just type up. Sweet. All right, so we just deployed a new version of our code to Lambda. Um, I think the fact that it finished means it's already running. And um, now we're going to go here, and we're going to click this button again. I think it's uh, Lambda cold start. OK. Now, I don't know if you can tell. It's a little bit faster, um, but I will show you the data. And it's a little bit slower every 10 seconds, because it's only cached for 10 seconds. OK. But when we go to this UI, we can really see what's going on, I think. It only updates like every once in a while, so if you want to get the newest data. OK. So we can see that from a Lambda cold start, when the Lambda was just deployed, it took three seconds. When we were actually hitting the API, it took 300 milliseconds. And then with the engine cache, it took uh, 500 microseconds. So you can see that it's much faster. And um, you know this cache doesn't do everything um, that you might want to do in the world with a cache yet. But if you've got an app that has a lot of public-facing data, like you're displaying concert information, you don't need new data every microsecond. You could cache that stuff for 10 seconds. No problem at all. And um, that's where I think using Lambda together with Engine, both of them are super easy to deploy because of this tool called, tool called Up and because of Fargate, which lets you run that container in an auto-scaling way. You don't have to worry about it. Um, I think they really work super well together. And that's what I'm excited about. All right. So looks like it worked. Um, so this is a screenshot of that chart, just in case we couldn't get it actually working. Um, but basically, yeah, you can actually even feel the difference when you click that button in graphical that instead of taking 100 or 200 milliseconds, it takes like no milliseconds at all. So that's pretty sweet. And you're actually saving that uh, performance on your back end as well, because you're not even hitting that REST API, uh, which is also super sweet. 
So basically, I'm really excited about this architecture right now. Um, it's kind of a new thing enabled by a couple of different new products, including Engine and Fargate and a bunch of other stuff. You get a whole bunch of stuff, including some things that didn't show, like um, if your Lambda actually crashes and returns like, you know, basically an error, uh, you'll actually be able to see that in Engine as well, because even though the Lambda has crashed, the container hasn't crashed because they're separated. It's part of the wonder of the cloud. Um, so I'm really excited about this architecture that I think is going to bring people some of the main benefits of serverless deployment, as well as some of the benefits of actually having a server and having that stateful architecture. Um, and I'm so excited about it. I'm definitely going to put together a blog post next week that outlines how to do this. Um, but if you guys want to dive in into the nitty gritty, uh, there's a great readme on this repo that you can check out. And I think that's all I've got. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sashko. We can take a couple questions if there are any. Any questions? Yeah. Please. How difficult to replace a function from the Yeah. Um, so if you go to the, uh, the question is, how easy is it to deploy my GraphQL API here? So I think there are a couple of things that make it real easy. The first thing is that this up tool is super simple because you don't have to, um, when you're usually deploying a node app to Lambda, you have to write some Lambda specific code. But because it just takes a regular Express server, you basically don't have to do anything at all. Um, so it's super easy. You could probably just deploy your server that you already have to there. Um, and like I said, you can find the directions to do that on this repository. But um, if you want to wait a little bit, I'm also going to put up more detailed, uh, easy to follow directions. Well, these are the directions I followed and it worked. But I'm going to try even harder next week. That's very true. Follow-up answer, if you want that caching but you don't want to use Lambda, you can also still use Engine. Uh, and you can even use Fargate. Yeah, that, but, that, that, that's what I was interested in. Uh, yes, that's correct. This talk is about a specific architecture, but um, you can use Engine by itself with like Heroku, with your AWS server, with ECS, with like basically any, with Kubernetes, like anything you want that can deploy a container. Sweet. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Really a lot Thank of fun. You, Sasha.